third year law student and a fellow with the Byron R. White Center for the Study of American Constitutional Law. On behalf of all of us at the center, thank you for attending. We are very excited to have you here today. I am honored to present our first panel, Institutional Complicity in U.S. Slavery, the Role of the Judiciary in Higher Education. Joining me here today are professors Brian Mitchell, Christopher Mathis, and Michael Higginbotham. Professor Mitchell is a native of New Orleans and is currently an associate professor of history at the University of Arkansas Little Rock and an associate faculty member at the Anderson Institute on Race and Ethnicity. A graduate of the University of New Orleans, Mitchell is a nationally recognized author of numerous papers, book chapters, and books. Recently, he is the winner of the 2021 Phyllis Wheatley Book Award for his book, Monumental, Oscar Dunn and His Radical Fight in Reconstruction, Louisiana, which was also Louisiana's selection for the Library of Congress's Great Reads from Great Places. Professor Mathis is a visiting assistant professor at the University of Iowa College of Law. Before joining the Iowa Law Faculty in fall 2021, Professor Mathis was an American Bar Foundation Access Lex Institute Fellow in Chicago, Illinois, where he remains affiliated with the American Bar Foundation. He recently earned his PhD from the University of Virginia School of Education with a focus on higher education. He also received his BS in mathematics education from Oakwood University and his JD from University of South Carolina. Professor Higginbotham earned his Bachelor of Arts degree, magna cum laude, from Brown University, his Juris Doctor degree from Yale University, and a Master of Laws degree with honors from Cambridge University, where he was a Rotary Scholar. Before joining the faculty at University of Baltimore in 1988, he was a law clerk to United States Court of Appeals, Judge Cecil Poole, an associate with David Polk, and a lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania. He has published numerous articles and editorials in law review journals and newspapers, and is the author of two books, Race Law, and more recently, Ghosts of Jim Crow. And with those introductions, Professor Mitchell, I now turn it over to you to begin our discussion. I feel that our session is well placed following the Tulsa uh, massacre for a number of reasons. Uh, I'm what people call an expert of difficult history. And what I mean about difficult history is it's the history that we don't like to talk about. The stuff we don't say, the stuff we hold back, the stuff that cities and our nation has buried. I see it as my responsibility to unearth this history. First, because it is the truth. Second, it explains so much about our condition in these United States. There's a, an uneasy thing that students always ask me. Is all American history this sad for African Americans. When does the happy part begin? And I tell them that the story of the African American is a story of re resilience and endurance. I'm often reminded of how I came to be a historian. I am a first generation scholar and I didn't follow behind a whole legacy of historians. In fact, I came to history because it was missing. I did not see myself in classes. I did not see people who look like me in textbooks. I did not hear the stories that my grandparents told me and my mother told me when I went to school about our great orators, our great leaders. In fact, all I heard is that we were slaves. 
1965, James Baldwin would debate Buckley at Cambridge University Hall. And one of my favorite quotes from that debate it comes from James Baldwin. It comes as a great shock to discover that the country which is your birthplace and to which you owe your life and your identity has not in the whole system of its reality evolved any place for you. This idea of absence of blackness is not by accident. It's not a matter of happenstance that blacks are missing. And while I could go into a lecture that would take a couple of hours, I have a handful of minutes to, sh to share with you what I mean by difficult history that we have been able to unearth in Arkansas, I will share four primary sources. What's important about history and historians is evidence. We call this evidence primary sources. Like the law field, evidence is important. It's the way that we prove our case. This first article ran in the, the Weekly Arkansas Gazette on April 6, 1855. Students often say, why do we talk about slavery so much? Wasn't that important? And it happened a long time ago. And then I show this article to them. Slave labor is necessary to the development of our country. Cotton and sugar, which are now necessities for the whole commercial world, cannot be raised without it. We believe it, slavery, to be morally as well as legally right, warranted by God's holy word and sustained by his law. And we believe the same God in his wise providence created the African race for slaves. Northern literature and Southern institutions in the weekly Arkansas Gazette, April 6, 1955. As Dr. Ayatora pointed out, in order for racism and white supremacy to survive, there needs to be continuity. There needs to be transmission. It has to be handed down. As the South Pacific uh, musical says, one has to be carefully taught. Almost none of my students know that in 1860, the state of Arkansas expelled its entire free black population. The call for this expulsion came from a handful of slave masters and was organized in a committee called the Committee of Citizens. Representing this Committee of Citizens, Albert Pike, serving as their attorney and a member of the committee, wrote this. The submission and loyalty of the slave must come from his conviction that his condition of servitude to a higher race is his natural condition. That such is law and the law is right. If you set constantly before his eyes the living contradiction of this doctrine of his unfitness to be free, what can you expect but dissatisfaction, murmuring, and sedition? If, therefore, our free colored population were fit to be free, if they behaved with property 
and restrained from instilling into the minds of slaves notions injurious to our and their own welfare, it would still be suicide, it would still be a suicidal policy to permit them to remain among us. What does that mean, is what my students say. What exactly do they mean? Free Blacks were among the most law-abiding citizens in the South. Why? Their very freedom hinged upon them not violating the law. There are no records of great insurrections in Arkansas. In fact, there are few even records of black people in the penal system there prior to the Civil War. However, Albert Pike and the Citizens Committee maintained that in order, in order to keep the condition of servitude alive in the minds of the enslaved, that free folk ought not live in, in Arkansas. You have to ask yourself, well, how do free folk move? Well, they were given to January 1st, 1860, to be out of the state. And those that remained were arrested and enslaved for a period of 12 months, leased out, and given whatever payment uh, was rendered for them to exit the state. If you were unfortunate enough to be a free black man that owned property and you could not sell it, then that property was seized, sold at auction, and the proceeds of that sale went to support the all white school system. This isn't taught in middle school or high school. In fact, most of my college students have no idea that Act 151 existed. Sadder still, and more recently, is the Elaine Massacre. When asked what the Elaine Massacre was, I have to explain to my students what sharecropping and debt peonage meant. How people went from the reconstruction to once again being like slaves in the American South. I have to remind them that debt kept sharecroppers attached to land. And I have to also remind them that these very sharecroppers were induced to go off to Europe and fight in World War I, being told that when they returned, that they would then be equal citizens in the United States. Upon returning, a group of veterans, finding themselves once again cheated in this scheme of debt peonage, would sue their land, their masters, those men that owned the plantations they lived on. In organizing a union to raise the funds for this lawsuit, masters would find out and they would attack the union. The attack of the union by these plantation owners was then called an insurrection, not on a part of the plantation owners, but on the part of the defenseless sharecroppers that were attacked. The leaders were put on death row. What we have before us, what you're looking at, is a report that was done by Colonel Isaac Jinks. And Colonel Isaac Jinks was an army colonel that was sent to lead a contingent of 500 soldiers to suppress the alleged insurrection. 
His point three on the fifth page of his report surmises what the object of the union was. The investigation into the causes of the uprising revealed the facts that an organization under the name of the Progressive Farmers and Household Union of America had been organized among Negroes. The object of this union, get this, were supposed to be better education, living conditions for the Negroes and the absolute equality of the races. Meetings of this union were held in a church with doors locked and sentry posted. The last of my primary sources that I would like to bring to you is about urban renewal. And we've heard a lot about dispossession during the course of this conference. This is about a particular community called West Rock that once sit at the bottom of a hill below Little Rock's wealthiest community. Why would the wealthy people at the top of the hill have poor working class people at the bottom? They wanted them conveniently located there. So their nannies, their chauffeurs, their gardeners were no more than a few minutes away. However, beginning in the 1950s, there was an attempt to dispossess this community of their land. Writing a letter to the editor of the Gazette, John Aaron Sr., and for full disclosure, um, that is my wife's um, grandfather. To the editor of the Gazette, I represent one of the pioneer citizens of West Rock edition. My grandmother lived and died here, and my mother is still living here. I have raised a family here, and I now have grandchildren living here. I have seen West Rock grow into the community it is now. The people of West Rock have complied with all the city's laws as far as sanitation, water, and sewage are concerned. We have improved our homes as the years have passed, and the majority of us own our homes and therefore are taxpayers. Our homes are about to be taken away from us for the price of a few hundred dollars, far below the price that we and our parents before us have paid for in the years of sweat and toil. They moved here when these same people that now want to take West Rock called it a health hazard and would not even drive their cars through the district. We have now, we have not disturbed anyone in any way. Settlements have grown up around us because we have shown the people what a desirable place this can be to live in. If we can't live here, where can we live? And this is the rub. This is the, the section that tugs at one's heart. As this community is being moved to the eastern half of the city, and there's a story behind moving it to the eastern half of the city. This is happening in the middle. Uh, if this is happening in, in 1953, we're on the cusp of the Brown decision. And the children of the servants will find, if, are not, if they are not moved, will find themselves going to the exact schools with the wealthiest people in the city. And rather than have that, they move the entire community out. 
The bottom paragraph in the editorial shows how wise John Aaron Sr. was. If we build another unwanted district through hard work and living under the most undesirable health conditions, these same people for their own pleasure will restrict us from what means from what it means to live our lives in happiness and the future of our children and grandchildren. The notion that he knew he knows the precarious nature he lives under, that at any point he can be dispossessed of land. And when we look at land in American history, this concept of property, life and liberty and property are cornerstones of our legal tradition. He knows that these mean nothing when they are possessed by black people. People ask all the time why I take up difficult history. Why don't I do something happier? Why don't I do something that's not always so sad? But I tell them I do this because of the voids that I saw as far back as second grade. <laughs> My grandmother would tell me stories when I came home from school. And one, and she didn't have a television. She was born in 1897. And we'd sit back and I'd look through photo albums. And I found a tattered old newspaper article. And it told the story of Oscar James Dunn, Louisiana's first black lieutenant governor and the first African-American seriously considered as vice president for the United States. I had no idea that I was related to this man. I had never seen his picture. I had never heard a word about him. This is 1976. You can see the, the flag in the background, the bicentennial year. And as we talked about US government in, in, in my second grade class, we were asked if anyone could name any other governors or lieutenant governors besides the current. I proudly raised my hand called out Oscar James Dunn. And the teacher said, never heard of him. I pointed out that he was the first African-American, not just in the state of Louisiana, but in the whole nation to have served in this capacity. And she replied, there's never been a black lieutenant governor of Louisiana. I corrected her saying there were three. Dunn, Pinchback, and Carpenter. I was sent to the office. What I learned from this was that history is often missing. And that history empowers the youth that is given to. And from that point on, I ask questions and I filled in gaps. And when I'm asked what I do, that's exactly what I say. I tell stories, I fill in potholes and gaps. Thank you very much.
<laughs> have some technical difficulties as usual. I'm used to it. <laughs> it's the world we're in. Thank you for that wonderful talk. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, first, I wish to extend my gratitude to the organizers of this conference, Professor Malvo, uh, and uh, for the invitation. I am both honored and humbled to share this space with so many brilliant legal scholars and scholars in general. Also want to thank Dean Buckner Ennis for writing such a provocative book. My scholarship situates squarely on her work and she makes my life as a scholar much easier for her hard work. Um, also, thank you to my mom for traveling all the way from South Carolina to be with me here today. Um, <laughs> so I'm excited to give this talk. With that being said, today we're gonna talk about higher education redress statutes, a critical analysis of states' reparations in higher education. As we've already discussed, Dean Buckner in this, uh, that higher education has a clear connection to slavery, to every aspect of chattel slavery from buying, selling, and exploiting black people on their campuses. In fact, slavery was not isolated to just one college. It indeed was a central pillar to many institutions in the colonial era from private elite schools like Harvard, Yale, and Brown, to flagship public universities like University of Georgia, University of South Carolina, University of Virginia, my alma mater. But beyond the devastating actions within the slaving economy, the higher education industry continued its racist practices and targeted, terrorized, and decimated black neighborhoods near its campus. Recognizing both the depth and breadth of the harm higher education industry committed to black people, four states, four states 
with five other states looking to pass similar laws, have passed laws to offer reparations because of their states, universities' involvement in black enslavement, harm, and degradation. The four statutes enacted largely have two goals or missions. One, to memorialize and identify those affected by higher education's harm, and two, provide a tangible benefit to individuals with a demonstrated historic connection to harm suffered. That all sounds great. That sounds really good. Um, but we know there is a problem, right? Well, the problem is that one, these statutes categorically ignore groups of black people, and two, these statutes are grossly under-inclusive. I contend that allowing lawmakers to strip away black people's deserved redress based on their subjective standards proves to be the most recent attempt of legislation that renders certain black people's pain as invisible and unworthy of intervention. And so with that, the remain of our time, together we will shine a probing light onto how these statutes enacted in four states um, are constitutionally under-inclusive, that I argue. So before we talk about specific examples, we must understand what under-inclusion is. I recognize that this is a legal audience, so I don't have to do too much legwork. But for those who do not understand, um, under-inclusion under is a constitutional issue and in non-academic, non-lawyer terms, simply means that the statute is excluding someone that should be included in a benefit or remedy. For clarity, for example, let's say that you are a lawful non-citizen living and working in America, paying your taxes every day. However, you fall ill and are unable, are, are, and are unable to work. But the government says that you are unable to receive welfare benefits given your citizenship status. The Supreme Court has ruled in Graham versus Richardson that such practices are under-inclusive because the law, the lawful non-citizens, like American citizens in this case, have also paid taxes. The court has after, the court has, after determining a law is under-inclusive, under has tended to remedy under-inclusive statutes by expanding the class of beneficiaries rather than striking the statute down. So to be clear, when a statute is deemed under-inclusive, the court extends and expands the benefit to those who were excluded. Given that backdrop, I now turn analysis to the four hers that I argue are under-inclusive. The larger project addresses four statutes that I argue are also under-inclusive. They are Florida's House Bill 591, Maryland's House Bill Number 1, Virginia's House Bill 1980, and Georgia's City of Athens and University of Georgia Resolution. I have coined the term HERS as an acronym to mean Higher Education Redress Statutes, as it adequately captures the array of legislation that compels the industry of higher education to investigate and remedy either their own or their state's role in slavery, discrimination, or degradation of black people. As representative of my overarching argument, I will offer two examples of how both the Georgia and Virginia higher education redress statutes are under-inclusive. Okay. So on January 19, 2021, Athens and the University of Georgia system signed a resolution supporting redress for Linentown, a neighborhood completely destroyed by white supremacy and by the University of Georgia's urban renewal plans. However, my critique centers around the fact that this legislation as crafted confines redress so narrowly only to the residents of Linentown and yet ignores other instances where the University of Georgia system conspired and conducted other acts of equivalent or more significant harm. For example, archival evidence from the University of Georgia Board of Trustee Minutes discloses that Linentown was not the only tract of land that the university divested from black people. The 1920 university minutes revealed that the university needed to buy the neighboring Negro property abutting our grounds and the contingents to the new women's building. 
The university agreed to purchase the Negro property, claiming it, it was, quote, essential to the protection of our property and the safeguarding of our young white women in our charge. As a result, the university forced black people out of their land, out of their businesses, to build a new women's building and a safer environment. Given the resemblance of the harm of Linnetown residents, seeing that the residents and the descendants of the Negro property are not accounted for in reparation bill, arguably deems this statute as under-inclusive. The second statute I wish to analyze is the Virginia's House Bill 1980. In analyzing the first clause of the statute separately, the individual had to have, had to have labored on the university campus for one to be worthy of identification and memorialization. Superficially, this language reads relatively straightforward, yet in its simplicity, stories will likely be forgotten given the unforgiven rigidity in the law if it remains unchanged. To illustrate this concept further, historical documentation maintains that the College of William and Mary participated in every aspect of chattel slavery, including insidiously selling young children away from parents. Taking the statute's words on its face, the sole children or people who did not labor but was sold before labor began on the campus would fall outside of the law's confines. As a result, their narrative, their stories, their existence would not materialize in the state's mandated memorialization program. Also within this first statute, first clause of the statute, the statute only extends to those who were enslaved individuals who labored on former or current, current institutionally controlled grounds and property. However, however, archival evidence demonstrates that universities also employed servants who endured similar inhumane conditions as enslaved people. So, but for their distinct titles, both servants and enslaved people were essentially, they essentially held the same status on campus. Yet, given the rigidity of the statute, servants and their descendants are unlikely to take under the provisions of the statute. As a general rule, the issue of under-inclusion regularly appears in reparation statutes or in cases where the benefit is largely conferred to minoritized people. Accepting these articles' arguments, a logical question one would ask is, well, what do we do now? Like, what is the next step? I argue that the problem presented in this presentation partly stems from the legislators being completely ignorant to the breadth and depth of the injury that the higher education industry commits toward black people. As such, I assert that a states empower an interdisciplinary commission to study the wide variance and depth of harms committed onto black people. And with that, I will include the rest of our time to Professor Hickenbotham, um, and I will give it to him. I'm going old school, uh, so no PowerPoint for me. I want to thank uh, uh, Dean Ennis and Professor Malvo and the Byron White Center for the invitation to speak today and also uh, for arranging this uh, wonderful conference. And I also want to thank each uh, and every one of you uh, for coming here today or, or for tuning in uh, because it's not easy to discuss issues of race in America today, especially when it's done across racial lines, because people tend to feel strongly about these issues. Uh, and sometimes they tend to disagree. When they disagree, they end up calling each other bad names and then uh, messes up their stomachs and they can't enjoy some of the good food and drink that's uh, often accompanies events like this. Uh, so they choose to stay away and put their heads in the sand. You folks have not done that 
And so I think you deserve some credit. Also want to uh, say how much um, I am uh, delighted to be here uh, because uh, I want to talk about the relevance of slavery uh, to today. And I think it's an important issue. Uh, I've always believed that uh, uh, if you don't know where you've come from, it's hard to figure out where you should go. And unfortunately, and this is something that uh, Professor Malvo alluded to earlier, uh, and uh, Dean uh, Ennis talked about uh, on her first day at Princeton University, uh, where she met a fellow. Unfortunately, too many of us, too many Americans today, they don't know where they've come from with respect to slavery. So uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, the history uh, of enslavement. I'm gonna talk about uh, how it's relevant also uh, for issues of today. Because too many of us have this distorted view of American slavery. Um, I like to call it the birth of a nation, um, gone with the wind view of American slavery, uh, where we just don't know the real reality. We just don't know the truth. And I thank um, Brian and I thank Chris for giving us a whole lot of truth uh, today. I'm gonna give you a little bit of more truth. Uh, I didn't grow up in the hood. Uh, I grew up in the wood. Uh, Western Pennsylvania, the countryside, the suburbs of Cleveland, and the suburbs of LA. But I can tell you this, whether it's the countryside or whether it's the suburbs, uh, there was a whole lot of racial profiling uh, by law enforcement that, that was put on me. Uh, I know you've heard of driving while black. I used to get stopped for smiling while black. So you can understand I got uh, arrest, uh, got stopped a whole lot of times. Not arrested, but stopped a whole lot of times because I like to smile. Back in the 1970s and 80s uh, in LA, uh, the LAPD uh, was known for coming up with new techniques for law enforcement. And uh, they came up uh, uh, with a couple of things like the rough ride and uh, the uh, chokehold. And uh, one of my favorite uh, comedians, uh, Richard Pryor. I guess it's okay for me to quote Richard Pryor. I got tenure, so I, I can keep, <laughs> keep my job here, but um, I'll quote Richard Pryor, the, the, the PD, PG rating version. Uh, Pryor used to open up his monologue uh, back in the 80s. He would say the LAPD has a new technique. Uh, it's called the chokehold. And uh, then he would say, yeah, I see all the black people out in the audience saying, yeah, nodding their head. Yeah, we know what you're talking about. And all the white people out in the audience saying, chokehold, what, what are they talking about? We don't know anything about the chokehold. And of course, that reveals the selective application of that apparently neutral technique uh, that was done by the LAPD. I thought the LAPD uh, came up with a whole lot of things. Uh, in terms of law enforcement techniques, but uh, they didn't seem to um, care much uh, about the appearance of some of these techniques being racist uh, or their actual uh, racist application. Um, I always thought the LAPD came up with the racial profile uh, until I found a case from the 19th century uh, called Hudgens versus Wright. That's what I want to talk to you briefly about. Uh, LAPD didn't create the racial profile. Uh, the Virginia Supreme Court created the first racial profile under the American Constitution in 1806. Hudgens versus Wright is the case, and it involved the disputed claim of freedom uh, by an enslaved person who was Native American. I know you like that, Adjua. An enslaved person who was Native American. And um, the court created this presumption of freedom based upon a racial profile, reasoning 
And I quote, if three people, one who appears to be white with a beige skin, a prominent Roman nose, and wavy hair, and a second person who appears to be Native American with copper-colored skin and long, jetty, black, straight hair, and a third person appears to be black, with dark skin, a broad nose, and woolly head of hair, or inclining thereto. If they come before a court claiming their freedom and there's no other evidence in the case, what should the court do? And the Virginia Court of Appeals said, well, we've got to send the white person and the Native American looking person they must go free. But we must send the black person simply because of the color of their skin, we must send them into slavery. Because the presumption of freedom, the common presumption of freedom, doesn't apply to black people simply because of the color of their skin. Now, the judges in this case went into great detail on the profile. And as uh, Adjua alluded to earlier, uh, there was no medical reasoning uh, for this profile. They simply created a social construct. They fashioned themselves as some sort of PhDs in barberology. Because here's what they said. They said, and I quote, nature has stamped the colored race with two distinct features, skin color and hair texture. And hair texture is the most revealing and enduring as it maintains a certain flexure through several generations, even when African ancestry is mixed with a preponderance of European ancestry. That's a quote. And that is why these judges in their profile use the following language, woolly hair or inclining thereto. Such a burden for even those individuals who had inclining thereto was impossible to meet. And most blacks with legitimate freedom claims did not uh, overcome this presumption because they couldn't provide any evidence establishing that they were free. So the presumption was the entire ball game. Now, for the 20,000 free blacks in Virginia in 1806, this was a denial, a basic denial of their due process rights. Now, there was a cruel saying when I was growing up uh, on the playgrounds, some of you may know about it. Uh, Kids used to say, if you're white, you're right. If you're brown, stick around. And if you're black, get back. And when I read this case, I said, wow, these judges have incorporated the playground saying into this case, which is exactly what happened. Now, as Professor Malvo talked about uh, this morning, she said, well, this, uh, a lot of people say this is old stuff, you know, this is ancient, this is ancient history. You know, what does it have to do with today? And uh, my students always ask me that. They say, hey, professor, man, that's old stuff now, come on. What does slavery have to do with today? Here's what I tell them. So while there are no longer, uh, there's no longer slavery in this country. We still have presumptions based on a racial profile reminiscent of slavery as depicted in the Hudgens versus Wright case. 
So the 1806 profile that was used to enslave many black people, many free blacks. The, in 2022, the racial profile is used to stop and frisk. It's used for driving while black. It's used for no knock warrants. It's used for rough rides. It's used for plea bargaining. It's used for school suspensions. It's used for SWAT deployments. It's used for civil asset forfeiture. It's used for juror selection. It's used for qualified immunity. It's used for chokeholds. Just to mention a few of the things that it's used for today. And while these terms that I just mentioned may sound neutral to you, may sound uncontroversial to you, last night at the uh, Dairy Arts Institute, we heard some powerful, powerful stories, firsthand stories about how some of these techniques that seem neutral, how they destroyed people's lives. This is real stuff, folks. Now, here's what I tell my students when they say, hey, come on, professor, old, this is old stuff, ancient history. I tell my students the profile is the same, blackness, the rationale is the same, safety, the impact is the same, denial of due process. Now let's talk about it. So I recognize that uh, there's a whole lot of things about today uh, where we see slavery's impact. We see it in language. Uh, that's used. We see it in sayings like uh, sold down the river or pork barrel spending. We also see it in economic disparities. There's an 18 to 1 disparity in terms of wealth accumulation between black families and white families today in America. 18 to 1. People say that's a lie. You look at any statistic that wants to talk about it and there's a huge gap whether it's 12 to 1, 15 to 1, 20 to 1. I said 18 to 1 because that's the latest federal government study. But you know what? There's a serious gap. And if you think about it, the gap originated during slavery, where uh, no enslaved persons were compensated for their labor, where no wrongfully enslaved persons, when the court said, you were wrongfully enslaved, now you're free, none of them ever got a dime. And there was no, of course, wealth generational transfer from these individuals. But the most significant aspect today, no question about it in my judgment, is in the criminal justice system and its devaluing of black life. Just like during slavery when slave patrols were given almost complete discretion to kill runaways, Today, police officers, sometimes called patrolmen, a reference, of course, to the original slave patrols, rarely suffer serious consequences for questionable, lethal uses of force. And there are many, many, many cases, of course, that would support that aspect. The message is the same that black life is less valuable, is less valued in our society today than white life. We see the message in so many incidents over the course of our history. That message uh, uh, is seen in Grant Parish, Louisiana, in 1873, messages sent in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1899. Uh, as we heard from Professor Mathis, that method is seen in uh, Arkansas, the Elaine Massacre in 1919. Uh, as we heard from the previous panelists, that message was sent loud and clear. 
uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921. And yes, most recently, that message was sent loud and clear on January 6, 2021 in Washington, DC. So what's my conclusion? If we're ever to end slavery's negative impact, we need to first begin with eliminating this powerful message that black lives don't matter. Thank you. So we are just about out of time. I do have one brief follow-up question for you all. And again, in the interest of time, I ask that you keep your replies brief as well, despite the fact we could talk about this all afternoon. Um, what do you think we could do to make things better? What, what, are there any solutions to the problems that we've identified? You want to start with you? Let's start with you. Uh, there are two things that I overwhelmingly see as things that would make things better. First, education. Um, we've got to create an equitable education system where all children are valued, where all children are given the commensurate education. Um, number two, uh, one of the things that we talk a lot about in my classroom is geography in the United States and the role that it plays in substantiating or the continuance of racism. Uh, I believe one of the reasons that uh, racism has survived is the distance um, that communities were able to keep from one another. Um, we're more segregated now than we've ever been in our history, geographically. Um, if you look back to uh, antebellum uh, time period before slavery ended, uh, black people were in white people's houses. Uh, then as blacks got more rights, um, devices were created to separate them. And I believe that if we can get back together, we can replace stereotypes with real experiences and that will erode those stereotypes. So simply to me, I think we have to be willing to face the music. We have to understand the role that history plays um, and be willing to address it head on, simply. Uh, so I think the problem that's created with the legislation attempts uh, legislators did not study. They, they were not educated enough to know the breadth and depth of the problems. And because they didn't ask, um, and for political expediency, they had to do something because the activists were so loud, they had to do something. So they enacted without thinking, like, this is a wide problem, right? And so I think um, being willing to face the music and tackling it head on is, a, a, is, is the first step to redress. Yeah, I agree. I agree with uh, uh, both uh, Brian and Chris. Uh, education, I think, is important. Uh, but I also think um, we need to recognize we got a problem. Uh, the eye cannot see what the mind does not comprehend. And uh, we, um, you know, we're, we're, we're too often in denial uh, these days. In addition, I think, to the education and the willingness to deal with the problem, uh, I think we need to empower our minority communities economically, educationally, politically. Um, and third, and we can do that through legislation. There's a lot of ways that uh, we can help to empower people uh, in these ways uh, through, um, through laws. And then the third thing I think we need to do um, is we need to have better laws uh, dealing not only with integrating our society, but also um, in stopping racism, stopping race discrimination. I mean, you know, we, we, we set up these laws that we passed, uh, you know, during the civil rights movement. And if you, you study these laws, there's so many ways to get around them. Um, this uh, this uh, uh, intent standard that we have in terms of Proven race discrimination is almost like the, the, the presumption that had to be overcome during slavery. Um, you know, in order to win a race discrimination case under the 14th Amendment, you have to prove intentional race discrimination. So you better have a tape 
uh, of somebody saying, you know, I'm not going, I'm, I'm not going to do this because they're black or because they're brown. Uh, I'm not going to do this. And um, without that, it's hard to prove intentional race discrimination. The worst uh, Supreme Court case uh, ever uh, has got to be the McCleskey case from 1986, death penalty case, where M Warren McCleskey, African American, says, look, there's a four to one differential uh, because I'm black and my victim was white that I'm going to get the death penalty. Nine justices on the Supreme Court say, we accept the disparity. There's a, a study that was done. We accept it. It's a wonderful study. Four to one differential because you're black and your victim was white. Five justices on the Supreme Court say, <laughs> intense standard. Um, you know, four to one is a differential, but it doesn't satisfy the requisite intent that you need to establish race discrimination. So five justices say, you know what? We accept the study, but it's not enough. We need more. Four justices in dissent, including Justice Marshall, the conscience of the judiciary, four justices in dissent say, you know what? What would be so wrong with accepting McCleskey's claim? What would be so wrong? The majority says, here's what would be wrong. If we accept McCleskey's claim, that opens up a can of worms in our criminal justice system. That undermines everything our justice system says it stands for. And the dissent's response, the most powerful thing I've seen in a dissent in their response, the dissent says, we think the majority has a fear of too much justice, a fear of too much justice. That's what we need to deal with. We need to stop having a fear of too much justice, change some of the laws, make this place a, a little bit better for everybody. Excellent. One final question. What do you think the appointment of Ketanji Brown Jackson symbolizes going forward? <laughs> I mean, it, look, if I died today and went to heaven and they, they say, hey, you can go back as anybody you want to go back. I want to go back as Katanji Brown Jackson. <laughs> Let me come back. I mean, that's a superstar right there. Everything we say we want in a justice, right. everything we say we want, she's done. Yet only 53 votes in the Senate. That's a tragedy. It needs to change. But I think, unfortunately, with the makeup of the court, there's going to be some powerful dissents from the dynamic duo of Justice Katanji Brown Jackson and Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Stay tuned for the powerful dissents, at least for the, the time being. All right. Thank you all so much for our fruitful discussion.